About a hundred years ago, between 1913 and 1935, a new philosophy arose in the United States called humanism. Christianity, based on the teachings of the Bible, had held that there were certain absolutes that God existed, he was good, evil was real. Humanism evicted God and put humans on the throne, making us the judge of all truth. Evolution spurned the thought of purposeful creation and suggested we're just accidental products of randomness and huge amounts of time. People began to pretend absolutes don't exist. But this robbed them of definite meaning and led logically to despair. For more detail about this, watch the later episodes of Francis Schaeffer's series on YouTube, How Should We Then Live? It was an excellent series when it came out in the 70s and still very relevant, relevant today. A Harvard professor named Timothy McCleary in the 1960s recommended people try drugs as an attempt to bring some meaning within their own head. But debacles such as Woodstock and the fallout of addiction showed this was another dead end. So, there's a scramble in the secular world to try to find some meaning and purpose in life, but without absolutes, without a willingness to make oneself accountable to a supreme being, as long as we insist that we ourselves are the ultimate source and measure of all meaning, knowledge, and value, we discover we're existentially bankrupt. We can't come up with meaningful meaning. What's the point? Who cares? I hear some people say Life has no absolute external reference points to give it uniformly acknowledged value. As a review of Schaefer's book, The God Who Was There, puts it, whether art, music, philosophy, the public came to understand that what they face is alienation, corruption, lostness, chance, randomness, despair. Or to use a term with French roots, that's what we call ennui. A feeling of utter weariness and discontent resulting from uh, satiety or lack of interest, boredom, a feeling of listlessness and general dissatisfaction. So secular folk do their best to escape into entertainment or vacations or substance usage that hopefully doesn't end in catastrophic addiction. Anything to numb the pain, the hurt, the, the boredom are unfilled love tanks. But there's an undercurrent, a gnawing feeling, perhaps fed by what remains of conscience, that whispers, there's got to be more than this, even in church life. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday before Lent starts on Ash Wednesday. The Gospels record that three disciples witnessed Jesus being physically transfigured. He underwent a metamorphosis, so his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light as he spoke with Moses and Elijah. That mountaintop's a long way away. That, that story seems a bit hard to relate to. It's a long way from our grimy, everyday, run-of-the-mill existence. But the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, insists there's a direct connection between that event and believers' lives. 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul uses the same Greek word for transformed, which the Gospel writers used for transfigured. This is what God means for us to experience ourselves. Why is my life so dull, boring, and mundane if Jesus is seeking to share that with me? Paul piques our interest by three word pictures, parables, metaphors, comparisons, if you will, in chapters 2 and 3 that suggest that we should have something inside that's appealing to those who don't know God. The Lord wants to use us to tell others. He wants us to stand out in a noticeable way that will attract others' attention. The first metaphor is pleasing perfume. 2 Corinthians 2.14, God through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Verse 15, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Some of you maybe get more turned on by coffee than by perfume, but if you can think of aroma of coffee, then you like that very much, that pleasing. Verse 16, we are the fragrance of life. New Living Translation, a life-giving perfume. 
Can you recall the last time someone walked by a, a waft of pleasing perfume caught your attention? That's something like the way Christians should be catching the attention of others. Not by our smell, but by our cell, our gospel, our good spiel, loving words and actions. Instead of smelling like roses, we can be smelling like Jesus, the aroma of Christ. The second comparison Paul uses is that of a letter, a personal letter. If your physical mailbox gets stuffed like mine, snail mail no longer has much thrill because it's usually bills or solicitations. My email inbox gets so much impersonal mail that it's often tedious to look through as well. At this point, it's when someone sends me a, a personal message on Facebook that my curiosity is most aroused. The spammers haven't found that avenue yet, at least not for me. In that sense, the Lord seeks to PM other people through us. 3 verse 2, you yourselves are our letter, known and read by everyone. Verse 3, you show that you are a letter from Christ, written with the spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts. It's been said, you may be the only gospel that other people ever read. You know, we talk about the gospel of Matthew, Mark, etc. God's spirit is still writing the, the gospel of Cheryl, or the Gospel of Rick. What is the letter of your life communicating to readers about the Lord? Paul's third analogy is that of a mirror, or if you're writing today, I'm suggesting it might be a car headlight. Verse three, no, chapter 3, verse 18, says, We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord as the Spirit. The Greek for reflect literally comes from mirror. Though the, the polished metal mirrors they had back then would probably be much inferior to our mirrors today. Except that verse beside 4, verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Light shining in our hearts. Mirrors reflecting the Lord's glory. Sounds like a car headlight to me. What others see is not the actual bulb directly. That would be God in the analogy. And even the, the bulbs themselves have this thing on the end. So you're not really seeing the light from the bulb. You're seeing the reflection out of the parabolic surface of the, the mirror in behind. Your caring phone call, your helping hand, that, that expenditure for a thoughtful gift, the time you took to just show up. All these things are ways that we mirror God's goodness, allowing him to shine into others' lives. Robinson comments, Miners carry a lamp on the forehead. Christians carry one in their hearts, lit by the Spirit of God. By the time 2 Corinthians was written, there were <clears throat> false teachers going around casting doubt on the validity of Paul's ministry. The circumcision party, or Judaizers as they're called, tried to convince Gentile converts they needed to be circumcised and start following the Jewish traditions if they really wanted to be holy. As Paul explained in more detail in his letter to the Galatians, this would have been a huge step backwards. In the latter part of 2 Corinthians 3, Paul contrasts the limitations of the Old Covenant with the dramatic truths of the New Covenant, the, the ministry of the Spirit, he calls it, in a way that should ignite our fervor and help us appreciate afresh what God has done for us so that we want to share it. It's a helpful exercise when you're looking through these verses just to draw a line down a page and draw a table contrasting the old and the new covenants. I see two main categories, the essence and the effect. First, the essence of the covenants, factors that describe their inherent differences. Uh, external versus internal. Verse 3, the old covenant of Sinai was carved on tablets of stone. The new deal is written with the spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts. It echoes through this section of Jeremiah's prophecy about a new covenant here, 31-33. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. External versus internal. God wants to do an inside job on us, a, a complete interior renovation project. Uh, things like reading scripture daily and communing with God in prayer are essential to get to know him personally in your heart. Dry versus dynamic. Verse 6 says the old covenant was of the letter, whereas the new covenant is of the spirit. Letters and papers and books are great, but they can't make you do one thing differently. 
theology just stays a study of books here. Spirituality is very dry. I mean, we need the Holy Spirit quickening our spirit dynamically. Dim versus superior. Paul's not saying that Torah or Jewish laws are bad. In Romans 7, he admits they were holy, righteous, good, and spiritual. But the principles only went so far. They were given in Sinai in glorious fashion, but the glory on Moses' face faded. Verse 7, that ministry came with glory, but was fading. Verse 11, what was fading away came with glory. Verse 10, what was glorious has no glory now in comparison. By contrast, the new covenant is superior. We're saying even more glorious. Verse 9, how much more glorious? 10, surpassing glory. Verse 11, how much greater is the glory? Paul's really building it up there. Another essential difference, redundant versus remaining and relevant. Verse 11, the old covenant's fading away. The New Living Translation says, has been set aside. However, the new covenant, verse 11, is that which lasts, that remains forever. The old one is now outmoded post-Pentecost. Even more interesting than the essence of the covenants is their effect on people. Deadly verses enlivening. Verse 6, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Romans, Paul spells out in more detail how sin inside, uh, inside us seized its opportunity through the law, starting to covet when commanded not to covet. Uh, so sin kind of perverted the law into becoming an accomplice to our spiritual death. By contrast, the Holy Spirit makes us alive, gives us new birth, spiritually speaking, when we trust in Jesus, producing in our lives the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Question for personal reflection here. Does my faith look alive? Are you just going through the motions? Are you getting kind of stuck in a routine? Is reading the Bible and church attendance just kind of mechanical for you? Do you cultivate spiritual interests by your reading, or, or do you just kind of plug into the umbilical cord of the world when you have spare time? It's just so easy to do these days. Deadly versus enlivening. Back to shaming versus saving. Verse 9. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? In Living Translation, the Old Covenant brings condemnation. The new one makes us right with God. The law kept score, and it identified trespasses like a cribbage pegboard, maybe. You, you knew where what you'd done wrong. You kind of was keeping track. But Jesus in the New Covenant actually did what no one else could do. He laid down his pure, innocent life in our stead so we could be forgiven. Our guilt expunged, our shame washed away, making us fit for moment-by-moment -moment connection with a holy God. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 31, 34. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Question for reflection here. Do I act like I'm condemned or connected? Jesus saves. Stop wallowing in the sin of shame from which he delivered you. Repent. Return to him. Be changed. Fact 3. Hiding versus encouraging. Verse 13. We are not like Moses who had put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. He hid his face because the glory didn't last. But for the believer in Christ, verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Paul uses a Greek term here related to courage. Not just bold, but very bold. It was very bold of Cheryl and her mom and the uh, 47 or whatever others to go to Haiti when there's a travel restriction on the Canadian government saying, don't go there, it's dangerous. That was very bold. Question, do I try to hide my faith or boldly share Jesus? Even such a simple thing as in a restaurant asking the waitress, she, waitress is talking about some things and you're sharing some personal things or like maybe ask, can I pray for you? That would be bold. Fact four, obscuring versus showing. Under the old covenant, in verse 14, Paul describes the Jews' minds as being made dull or hardened. A veil covers their minds. A veil <coughs> covers their hearts, verse 15. 
For as when a person believes in Christ, the veil is taken away. Remember in a wedding, how at the wonderful moment uh, the brides had the veil over the face and at the end of the ceremony, lifting the veil off. Um, verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Verse 18, with unveiled faces we all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed, transfigured, metamorphed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Living Translation says, We are mirrors brightly reflecting the Lord's glory, become more and more like him, and reflect his glory even more. When other people look at us, they will see a resemblance to Jesus. Not long hair or beard or sandals, I'm not talking about that sort of thing, but sacrificial love in action. Are you an icon of Jesus? In the words of Jeremiah's prophecy, I will be their God and they will be my people. Question for reflection. Are people seeing Jesus in me? How so? The last effect, uh, number five, freedom. Verse 17. Now the Lord is a spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The spirit quickens or makes alive our spiritual inner being. The spirit also beckons us to keep in step with him, follow his dance moves, as it were. It's wonderful to see some of the children and adults dancing in the video there. Not in bondage or enslavement to sin. We're, we're freed from our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. <coughs> For Jeremiah 31. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. They're released. You're free. How free are you? Have you quenched or grieved or somehow resisted the Spirit's influence in your life? You ask yourself this question. Does my religion come across as duty or delight? The Spirit makes us want to please the Lord out of love for Him. It's entirely different from an attitude of rule-keeping or checking off do's and don'ts. The Lord has so much for us to mature in as we listen to His living voice. The Mission to Haiti team shared much of their experience on their blog. It was touching to see the photos of the orphans and villagers and hundreds of children being nurtured spiritually by VBS and physically by beans, rice, and medical treatments. But God was also working in the lives of those who went. There were tears in the medical clinic when lack of resources limited options for critically ill patients. There were more hugs and tears of a happier sort when families were welcomed into sturdy new concrete and steel roof homes. One man I know was described as having his face crumpled with emotion. Ezekiel prophesied of the new covenant. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The Lord bless and lead you into a fuller experience of his new covenant, one that allows your heart to crumble rather than be stony. Amen.